So this is the justice court. This is the one well, I talked about a little bit the other day. You'll look at the you'll notice the budget target for the justice court generates a revenue to the general fund. Um, that revenue is meant to support the traffic team, essentially, and have a base level of revenue to the general fund that existed before the traffic team came into effect. Essentially, um, I just shark. There he is, right there. Right there. Yeah. Well, you're about 30 seconds late, but I didn't get that far. Yeah. Yeah. He was starting right out, though. I know. Yeah. Um, what I was just going over was uh, your budget target, so and, uh, and I'll kind of give a synopsis in a minute. Let you get some highlights and that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, what I want you to notice on, on the budget target is, you know, last year we had a budget target of 730000 roughly in revenue to the general fund. After we adopted that budget target, you'll remember that we had some issues with uh, House Bill 2712, which essentially was a money grab by the state, and we were projecting that to be between a half million and three quarters of a million less because of the impacts from that. Um, that was three months into the fiscal year. Uh, we did. Judge Charter, myself, and probably Judge Limhouse probably spent the most time. Judge Limhouse is from uh, Lynn County, right? Yep. Uh, spent a lot of time working on that issue with the legislature. We were able to get most of the impacts from that bill turned around, but they didn't go into effect immediately. So we still saw a drain in what would have been revenue to the county until under the new law and under those cases that were prosecuted under the new law began collecting uh, revenue. Um, so a lag time coming back to the general fund. We were able to close a big portion of that gap, as I said, with the sheriff's budget. The first day we did budget hearings that the sheriff had a couple of months where they, probably three months, where they did a lot of work on traffic enforcement, which really helped close that. So, you know, even though the budget target was 730, we were looking at a flat contribution to the general fund, which essentially means the sheriff's traffic team would have cost the general fund rather than having been paid for from the revenue it generates through the Justice Court, that $750,000. Um, we did, from that $730,000, I'm sorry, I just said seven fifty. from that $730,000, we increased the revenue projection $250,000 for this coming fiscal year for a total budget target almost at a million dollars. That's a, about a million dollar turnaround from where we thought it would be, but only two hundred fifty from what we budgeted in additional revenue. Um, so the budget target ends up generating a little over a million uh, to the general fund. Um, now this is contingent, of course, on the bill that we used to fix, House Bill 2712, uh, which was uh, House Bill 2562 actually working as we believe it will work. Um, we, this special session, I did a lot of communicating back and forth with the legislature about uh, a stopgap measure to account for that lag time. We didn't get that, but it still, it still may occur at some point, mostly because a lot of the sheriffs are concerned with it, because that didn't only affect our justice court, it affected court security funds throughout the state for all the sheriff's department that are required by the Constitution to provide security uh, for the court. Um, so, um, but I think it's a much better story than where we started last year, and it's a much better story where we thought we were going to end because of those changes. Uh, a couple of things also that I think are uh, really, really impressive, a lot of work by Judge Charter on this as well, is uh, we were able to consolidate Central Points Municipal Court and the Shady Cove municipal court with our justice courts and all those cases are being handled by us and we are talking with some of the other cities continually about what we might do we can talk with the circuit courts about some things we might be able to do uh, for them um, in, in the civil and mediation style uh, low-level uh, violation level um, issues so we're, we're hopefully going to move more there it's way more cost effective than what the city courts were because the city courts had to carry all that overhead for a small caseload. We're carrying a smaller overhead for a larger caseload. 
and it's hugely more effective cost-wise and time-wise than the circuit court because you know you got four or five staff staffing a circuit court when you include all the support staff, bailiff, court security, and the uh, judge and uh, judicial assistants. So we've got essentially two staffing the court now and a support person. So it really is a, a very um, efficient way to affect the lower level violation issues that the Justice Court mostly deals with. And the, the uh, two cities that we've joined with uh, are very happy, very, very happy with the service that Judge Char is providing. In fact, they came over and sat through his court. Uh, one of the city managers talked to me about doing that. So they're happy with that and their police agencies are happy with it. So there is no increase in staff in this budget right now. But obviously, as we begin to take on other people's work, we may need to make some adjustments for that. But it's a kind of a constant evaluation. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's kind of a net revenue to the uh, general fund that goes towards the sheriff's general fund budget target to support the traffic team. And it does support the traffic team at this point with what we projected. And in the previous year, what we projected, not what we thought we were going to actually realize. And then the only kind of other major thing that I talked to you about that's actually in the county administrator's capital improvement budget is the architectural services line item budget for, uh, or line item expense for the uh, new or remodeled justice court, depending on how we end up doing it. So I'm, I'm satisfied with what the uh, justice court submitted. Uh, I think it's much better position, and then I'll kind of let Judge Charter throw in on top of that if, you, if you'd like. And then since this is, let me go through the spill. Uh, this is not a deliberation for them, Judge Charter, but they may ask some questions when you're done and I'm done. Put you on hot seat for a little bit. All right, I, I would enjoy that. In the, hot seat. Uh, the Justice Court is in really good shape uh, compared to where we thought we were going to be. Uh, these projections, both for current and next fiscal year, in terms of volume, are probably low. The, uh, the traffic team has uh, been uh, going great games, and they're saying this a lot of places. So, you know, we could be looking at, uh, in terms of case volume, you know, uh, a record for our court. And certainly in this coming fiscal year, if uh, current trend continues. Uh, on the revenue side, uh, it seems like we've been fighting with and in the legislature over the last four years. Um, and Danny has been a constant ally there. I was president of the Oregon Justice Peace Association, so that helped um, to be involved in that. Um, but it's sort of like the old saying, you know, the legislature is in session, and so we should all be watching our pocketbooks or in fear of our liberty. Um, so as far as, you know, um, 2013 calendar year is going to be close to 2009, uh, which uh, the, the other, we seem to be going on odd years, the record year for us was uh, 2011. And then I'll just, I'll give you our lobbyist view. Uh, I just came from the Spring Judges Conference in Newport, and he said it was a good session, a good mini session, because there was nothing that affected us. That's the good news. The bad news is that uh, Josephine County would like to have a justice court based on what their public safety environment is there. Uh, but part of the statute requires that the justice court not be in the county seat. And so they're going to go to the legislature and ask uh, for exemption from that. There are exemptions for some rural counties under that statute so that they can have a justice court in grants pass. It really has our lobbyists worried, because every time you know, the courts are on the radar, then it sort of invites tinkering, and once things go into committee, we don't know what they're going to do. So um, I don't know whether to view this in the strain of um, this is the boy crying wolf again, <laughs> because we've been here, we've seen to be here every couple of years with the legislature. 
Um, but it may well take the kind of uh, diligence in monitoring what may come out of just because of proposal. Um, I don't want to paint too black of a picture because we're we're doing good right now. But personally, I'm I'm not sure I would be building a building knowing what may happen, which may include. I mean, there are some voices I think, including the representative uh, Nathanson from the main county. Who would be voicing that you know, justice courts ought to be abolished or consolidated into the circuit courts, etc. So we'll have to see what the future brings. But right now we're we're looking at it. So let me put a little positive spin on that. There's been talk almost every session that I've been involved with for the last 20 years of abolishing justice courts. There are justice courts that have existed in county seats that predated the exemption for them not to exist in county seats, and they're seeking essentially an exception like those previous counties got, which is you know, probably unfair to other counties who have located their justice courts outside of the county seat, but not uh, unpractical, especially for a county that has you know two cities, essentially. Um, and um, I think the other kind of important thing here is the state. You know, and I'm not I'm not sure why this is, but uh, when 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 I ran my two businesses, I called this mailbox money, you know, where you have set up contracts and you don't do a whole lot of work for the money to come and get it out of the mailbox and that's what you did. The state gets mailbox money from the counties who run justice courts. They don't invest in them. They provide no revenue for them. We provide all of the uh, uh, revenue towards the expenditures. I mean, we fund everything that the justice courts do. And then we write them a check every time that they come through our system. And instead, they want to take, this, when I say that, some legislators, and I'm going to say probably more legislative fiscal office, and maybe a little bit of legislative council, but more so legislative fiscal office in my opinion, wants to take and move all of those cases into the circuit court where they can't handle the cases because they don't have, you know, they're understaffed with the judges to begin with. And they want to set up, you know, a rain of ramas where they're running people through traffic court, you know, days and lines that people get to go stand out there and wait. And they don't, they're not as efficient as we are, so they actually don't earn a revenue off of it. It actually puts them further in debt to bring those cases into the state system. So it makes absolutely no sense to me. And we have fought this battle for decades, literally. <laughs> And I don't uh, see us not fighting the battle. We'll constantly be, you know, at the state with it. If the state could just have us, the county, run and pay for the court, and then they could take all the money, that's what they would like. But that makes absolutely no sense. Well, it made some sense to some people along the way because they passed bills that have done that. But, but I, I think, you know, I'm not going to be pessimistic about it because I think it's just a constant discussion in uh, reminding the legislature of, you know, the fact that. Justice courts have been around a lot longer than anything that they're dealing with, and that they really are the basis for serving justice in our state way before the district and circuit courts came along. Uh, so they have a much more grand history, albeit not as grandly funded or grandly uh, extravagantly built and those kinds of things, but uh, they've served our population well. We'll keep fighting the fight. Judge Charter, though, he's got some homework to do because the main person who knows a whole lot about this doesn't have much longer and probably sitting on the bench and definitely needs someone to follow, follow in his footsteps of being the historian. We're going to adopt that as our motto. So we do more with less. No, I would just say the one I, I did uh, testify in front of the Ways and Means Committee when they came to Ashland, the one thing that seemed to make sense to them is, you know, I'm different from all these other speakers. I'm not here with my handout for a very worthy program. I'm just asking you to allow us to continue sending you millions of dollars per year. And that seemed to make some sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we're talking about budgets too, but the other thing that made a lot of sense is we put together a presentation showing the fact that by effectively implementing our traffic team, we had the highest per capita death and major injury rate in the state 
uh, before we started the traffic team, and we're in the bottom quarter of that now. I mean, we've significantly reduced the number of deaths on our county roads and highways and major uh, medical incidents, um, and we have the data to support that. So it's not just about the money, especially with regard to our justice court and how we operate as a traffic team. There was, I mean, this is amazing to me, but there are some counties that had three and four justice courts. I think Lane County had four. Did they have five? I think they have you know, four justice courts spread throughout the county, and they had closed them all down except for one because of the money grab from the state. And they didn't, I think they still have the one, but they're considering closing it this next budget cycle. So <coughs> the state has a way of uh, making a quick impact when they decide, you know, they're going to do something. Uh, luckily, we've been, you know, it, it is efficiently managed. It's well ran. Judge Charters are respected. Not only is he an attorney running a justice court, but he's a respected judge, he's fair, uh, firm, consistent, runs his court well, and we get very, in fact, I, there's two or three commissioners here, they could probably agree that I don't know if their whole three years, three and a half years that they've been here, they've received a call or a complaint about the justice court. It's one of those places that, that one. <clears throat> yeah. so yeah. I think that speaks a lot, because you know, if I was saying development services, they might say, you know, something different. But. <laughs> well, or any department, sheriff's office, animal control, anything, we just clarification <clears throat> on a central point police they write a ticket you you handle that does the whole, all the revenue from that ticket go back to central point or do you charge them some kind of I think we split it equally Pardon? we split it equally split it equally mm -hmm. yeah there's state law about how that happens and it's a 50-50 split if it's the county that refers it, of course, the county keeps 100%. And then if the county is providing contract service to a jurisdiction, the county does if they don't have their own justice court or their own municipal court. So the city benefits by pure revenue. They get the same no deal the state gets. With no cost. Yeah. Does the state get a cut out of that then? Yes. <laughs> the state always gets a cut out of everything, and it doesn't matter whether they're involved. I didn't get into it. Yeah, yeah. 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 That almost sounds like a gangster kind of routine, doesn't it? It's called a franchise. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's been interesting about Central Point is uh, you get things like uh, municipal code ordin ordinances, uh, noise violations, so it's almost like I'm a, a mediator role helping people, reminding people how to be nicer to each other as neighbors. So, so and there's more of that with the, with the city. So it kind of spices up your day a little bit. Then. Mm, yeah, it's a different set of skills. <laughs> but, you know, like an example would be, you know, young kids uh, racing their engines. And the complainant is trying to sleep. So we just work out. You know where the problem is. Don't go in turn off their, their monster truck, knock on the door, tell them, you know, try to sleep. And, you know, kids, you can help this lady out. It would be it would be much harder for her to file a complaint against you if you were, like, you know, working in her garden or something. So those kinds of things would be interesting. You know, Judge, I hadn't thought about it before. That's interesting. In the county, we don't have a noise ordinance. When you're dealing with cities, there is a noise ordinance. So yeah. you have to know all the rules. Yes. Or be able to look them up quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Judge Char, we're, I got I got to wrap this one up. So All right. Let's move on. Good to see. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to see revenue. Just doesn't happen a lot, does it? Those two oh, okay. oh, that's it, Tracy. I'm telling you. Yes. Does everyone know uh, Josh and Joe from our assessor's office? Yes. Mm -hmm. County assessor and uh, the beard must be uh, catchy. Yeah. Uh, it was the, uh, that's <laughs> November no shave. Some of the that's the thing, Dick. You don't, don't know that? Youngsters. Yeah. 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 So what I want to kind of hit the high points on the assessor's <laughs> budget. Um, they do show a reduction in FTE from uh, 30, 31 to 30. That actually happened during 
the year here that they'll carry over to next year. Uh, one thing I want to point out about that, because especially for those of you who have been around a while, under our previous assessor, we had 43 FTE. So we're at 30 FTE. And I'm going to say a lot of that has to do with the fact that we, even before Josh, but as Josh has come in with Joe and carried on too, you know, we did a lot of reorganization in how the department was being ran when the previous assessor resigned. And we were able to significantly cut costs and make the department hugely more efficient. Um, and Josh and Joe have carried that forward each year. I think they've continued to reduce the staff uh, FTE. Um, the the, the kind of high points behind that, I know the budget committee is, well, do you have enough employees to work? And I am in constant contact and discussion with Josh about that to make sure that he feels he's adequately staffed. The difference is really how the teams are organized, the work they do, reduction in cost for vehicles, you know, um, how they're moving about doing assessments in the county. Um, and you know, I just, I, I want to really point that out, even though that's not necessarily, it is tied to the money overall. It's been incremental, but that's a, a very significant way, a change in the way the department's operated. And what we're really seeing out of the department is more efficiencies than we were seeing with 43 staff. And that's even more impressive to me, um, the way they've done the work. Uh, a couple things I want to point out, because we talked about this in the December meeting, is we had previously got authorization from you to fund the uh, software. It, it was Manitron and went to Thomson Reuters. Software upgrades, I think we were going to spend close to $2 million in that project. We got into the project. We ended up um, giving them notice of default. We were able to get a refund of the investment we made with them. The purchases we made that we need for updating our infrastructure, we're able to use those servers for where we decided to go. And this budget represents moving back from that um, software acquisition, installation, and development, moving into um, who was our old vendor product, the uh, Orcats Helion, but with a new governance model and an updated platform. Um, the old platform was really um, vulnerable. It was unaccommodating to us. The changes that we would need that were unique to Jackson County were slow in coming, and the support was very poor. <coughs> Through the process, all of that's changed. What we're able to do essentially is take that additional savings, and it'll be, and I talked about this in December, build the fund balance. It's about a million and a half dollars. And then Josh and Joe were able in this budget to fund the upgrades in the within the budget so we're not coming to you and asking for more money and the maintenance cost within the budget so in addition to dropping those 43 to 30 FTE we're able to fund all of this without coming and asking for uh, more dollars which I think is also uh, something that they should be acknowledged for and congratulated on um, in terms of the budget you know um, they are fairly large consumer of the general fund um, but last year their budget target was two million nine hundred forty four thousand seven hundred seventeen dollars this year it was two million eight hundred fifty thousand one hundred seventy three dollars and they came right in on the uh, budget target so we took the last year's target we gave them the one percent increase that the budget committee agreed to for budget targets uh, we were able to back out of hundred nine thousand eight hundred sixty eight dollars in cost from per savings and also uh, the uh, CPI adjustments we had budgeted for managers but not authorized last year. We didn't spend it. And so, you know, you're, you're talking uh, almost a $100,000 reduction in their budget, including one FT reduced, the reduction of a $2 million capital outlay and a, um, for the software package, and the cost for maintaining and acquiring the software package in their budget. So I don't have any complaints whatsoever about this uh, budget, I think that they've been uh, done a really good job in our, you know, just being effective. So Josh or Joe, I don't know if you guys want to pile on there or if there's something that you want to make sure that the budget committee hears about that I didn't cover. No, you hit the topics that I was going to talk about, you know, Helium, they're going to a five-year regret. Um, it's going to cost us $25,000, and that's like Danny was saying, it's built into the budget. But basically, they're they're getting away from the consortium model, which she had 12 counties basically fighting always for their opinion and 
they want this done, this done, and it was almost impossible. So they've changed their business practices. Um, going back to, you know, we're down to 30 FTE, but even with those 30 FTE, we've had a turnover of about 15 um, different people coming in to either they retired or nutrition, um, other things like that. Um, so the way we've made it more efficient is we're streamlining stuff that historically somebody was dealing with for 20 straight years and did it their way. And us cross-training and de of those positions, I think, has helped us get a better look at how to do it better and more efficient and save money and do more with less people. So. I make a comment on the one FTE that we reduced and this fiscal is it was transferred to taxation, the veterans and deferrals. So kind of a collaborative piece there and it was very effective for customer service during the um, tax season that um, a lot of people you know, just down taxation came in. Taxes they didn't have to come upstairs so it was a lot more friendly for the citizens of Jackson County coming in. Yeah, yeah, it helped me a little bit on this question. Uh, over the years, we had a discussion on reappraisals. And, <laughs> you know, we were going to make a lot of money on it, which is not true. Yeah. We, we didn't, I didn't ever believe that, Dick, when you said we were. I never agreed to that. That was something that a previous Ross assessor said, stated. Got to yeah. fund enough money to make everybody, you know, Anyway, that really wasn't my question so much as what, what kind of progress are we on or what kind of time frame on reappraisals are we on? And it seems like, uh, well, it kind of moves, that subject moves around and I, I'm uncomfortable where we're at. Or where yes, we're let me clarify the question for you. It was recalculation, moving to the method of recalculation, not okay. reappraisals. I mean, reappraisals are one thing, recalculation is a type of method of yeah, reappraisal. That's what I said, help me. So what Dan Ross had to lead is we moved to recalculation and we applied it. He went out and applied it to, I think, Ashland, Jacksonville, and East Medford that he could generate enough revenue to support those additional positions. I think back then you authorized six, I think, if yeah. I remember correctly, positions. He never got anywhere close to doing what he said he was going to do. I mean, not even close, not even covering the cost of one position. He did generate additional tax revenue to all of the taxing districts, which is a, was a positive outcome of what he said he would do, but it was based on the fact that we would be able to support those additional positions to do that, and that didn't happen. So there's there's a di different methods between recalculation and trending, and I'll let the expert talk to that, but I think we've moved away from the recalculation into uh, trending again, but I'll go ahead, Josh, you, this is where you can pick up. Um, us going from the Manitron to back to Helion, Basically, while we were converting into that new software, we were spending ample amounts of time, probably 50% of some of the staff's time, just trying to convert that data. And now that we've changed directions, now we can go back to the reappraisal and the calculation. They're kind of tied together. So say you take East Method and use uh, the current sales to revalue all those properties in East Method. At the same time, you still need to have uh, boots on the ground to be able to go out and reappraise. Because if you haven't seen a property in 20 years, some of them haven't changed, but some of them have. And so the process back in 2006 when we approved all those positions was, is we hit door to door. And it just wasn't, it didn't pay for itself. And most of the time we can't get into houses. And if somebody, you know, remodeled the interior of their uh, uh, home, you're not gonna see it anyways. Um, so there was no, there was no bang for your buck from that method. Um, now that we have GIS and tablets out in the field, what we have is we have 2012 aerials, we have the footprints of what we have in our records, and if you overlay those two, you can get a vast majority to see if that house has changed since the last appraisal. And if it looks like it hasn't, then we'll just go to the next one, the one that looks like it. So they're kind of hand in hand where you recalculate it, but at the same time you have to reappraise. Right now we're doing um, Phoenix talent and rural areas. So by, by going back to our current software provider and going down that path, now we can actually go back to appraising rather than just converting data. So 
So I have a follow-up question, if I may, yeah. on that. Uh, and by the way, pick on Jacksonville, not East Medford, but uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Jacksonville, don't worry. <laughs> but, but now, as I as I recall, well, some of the issues, when, just in, in the residential side, but in the commercial side and such, as we had not got into a business for some time, the, the notorious Burger King settlement had increased a lot of this. Good stuff. <laughs> well, I'm taking the pressure off these members. Uh, but it was shared here, I think, during your budget uh, meetings last year about that issue, about finally being able to get back and start the praising on on upgrades of uh, personal half property. Yeah, personal personal, personal property. I'm, where, where are we at on that? Slow going. Okay. So the person that we did have to sign, she retired with three days' notice. Um, so we haven't really got the ball rolling too well on the personal property audits. But My understanding well, it was it could be rather substantial. It could be, but it still could go back to the same thing as what was promised in 2006 of it may not be. We just have never had that mechanism to go and uh, audit the personal property stuff. And they can only go back and capture five, five years of term mm -hmm. as personal Yeah, but property. then you got to... And the thing is, is that say a computer's five years old, it ain't worth anything anymore. It may, you know, even after a year, it's, it's already depreciated probably 40 to 50 percent of that value. So um, Washington County, we're trying to use their um, example of they have four people doing it, and they initially picked 26 properties to go to, and that took them a year to do 26 properties because it is four, four people. Four people. Yeah. Can you uh, talk a little bit, I don't know if you have, I can't remember the exact number, but there was several this year that you found complete houses that were built that were on the tax rolls because they were never permitted construction, they didn't go through any proper approvals, they were never appraised, do you remember how many of those there were this year? Um, like whole houses. I don't, you don't remember. Okay. No, I mean the one that really stands out is the... Uh, the tree house. The tree house that was on TV. Yeah. So there's, there's, you know, um, there's a lot to catch. And the, get, you know, those tablets that I think Dick and Craig were maybe here, but everyone else wasn't, that were included in the previous assessor's budget, set in boxes for, I think, two or three years. And, uh, they never got out. The, 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 you know, part of the reorganization we did was to, put that technology on the ground. We were able to sell some of it back, which was good, because it hadn't been used, but really overlaying those previous maps with the current maps, and you're just seeing the difference in delineation between new construction and what was there you know, in 06. We really only have to go back because you can only capture five years anyways, even if there was new construction, um, is helpful. And then on the recalculation piece, you know, you're looking at, Josh, talk a little bit about but what are all the other improvements, because you, while you can't raise the tax rate, you can capture and recalculate for all of those improvements. I, I guess just to keep it simple in my mind, I, I have a number like every six years you've got to reappraise property. Is that, is that right or wrong? That was prior to measure 50. And so that, after yeah, that, so it, it, like he touched on, now you're just using sales to train your data. And so that kind of stopped with measure 50. It's not required, but it's, it's not required, but to, to keep the value is somewhat in line with the current market. Yeah. You need to do it about every six years. So measure measure 50 allows you just to trim the property with sales. That means you didn't go out and reappraise it every year or every, within every six years of what the loan was. Uh, if, if you remember, I think last time we were, last time we've done a complete reappraisal of all properties, like 18 years, I mean, that's, since it's been well, yeah, a full, long time. Yeah, but you go back to measure 50, I mean, that's makes sense. Well, we weren't even doing it. Right, because but we didn't have to. But the reason why you want to is to capture all of those changes that would increase the market value. I guess what I'm trying to get at: Do you have a schedule or something in mind that says, hey, given the loading of people we have, every <coughs> six years, every eight years, every ten years, we'll probably cycle through this, or we'll never. Right now, just we'll on the top of my head, you're looking at probably every ten to twelve years. However, we do want to get into that six-year thing because. When we started it, Ashton was in 2006, then we had East Medford, then West Medford, Rouge, Jacksonville, uh, Central Point, Gold Hill, and so on. So now we got about 40% of the county left to do, which will hit the Phoenix, Talent, the rural areas. 
but then in the next two to three years, we can pay the Road River area and then people point more. And so at this point, because we cut it, we stopped doing it for two to three years because of that software conversion. Otherwise, those areas would probably be close to being done. And I, so I also think it's probably going to be longer. I mean, I don't, I don't want to crush dreams or anything, but the reason why I think it's going to be longer is, you know, they're having a whole lot more red tag uh, appraisal, you know, new construction. It's picking back up, so that is going to draw the appraisals from doing reappraisals, a recalculation to the new construction, and then th that will probably necessitate the need to look at the staffing levels, and that's that's been pretty level until this year. And like I said, with development service office the clerk and assessment that picks up their workload significantly and we get those permits for new construction. I really don't have a problem with whether it's six years or ten years but I would like to understand a policy Danny that says every X number of years we'll take a look at the property again. Process. So so let, let me let me answer I don't mean to be rude here. The assessor is an individually elected official. I can't set a policy like that. You can. Hold on. Just let no, me finish. But I'm, I'm looking at you because you say these things better. I mean, every time I say something, it's against the law. Or <laughs> it's, 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 it's <laughs> well, well, I guess what, the reason why I'm saying that, Dick, is it's not even required by law that we do that. So if you're wanting to base a budget decision on that being yeah. done, then what we would need to do, and I think I'm going to get here, is, is then what we would need to do is we would need to get a number that your that the budget committee is comfortable with. And then we would need to staff the assessor's office to make sure we can meet that number. So what Josh is telling you is, you know, it might be 10 or 12 years under his current staffing, under his current workload. What I'm telling you is that current workload is likely not to be the current workload. It's likely to go up, which extends that 10 to 12 years, unless we're adding staff resources. So if you want to put more money into it and you want a definite, this is how many years it's going to be, and I don't, it doesn't matter to me, then we got to make sure we're staffing this office. Well, first off, you have to make a determination. Is this important? Is it fair that we should do this? Or, and then set a time frame. But it, it's like if you push one area in, a, in, in, in the assessor's office, then another area bulges out. Or this area, we can't do it because we don't have the time because we're doing this. And what I'm trying to get at, Maybe my bad history with the assessor's office, not you, yes, but is how do you say all these things assessor does has to be done in a certain time frame or so forth so that as new construction picks up, we really know that these other things aren't being left undone and all of a sudden we're 10 years behind the the game or we aren't doing it because we took the manpower to handle the crisis. Sure, well we just, I mean that's it. And I, I agree with you. We, we match yeah. staffing levels to workload. I mean, and they have a good grasp of what their workload is now, way better than I'm going to say before. And they have a good grasp of what's coming in the door. They know how many staff they need to do their job. And I'll, I mean Josh can probably verify this. It's probably monthly at least. I have a conversation with Josh about do you have enough to do the workload you have today? Because if not, I need to figure out how to work with the budget committee to get you guys what you need. They're making it work with what they have. That would be, you know, that would be setting some goals, vision, that, that kind of stuff further out. My my only, you know, my my lack of comfort with what you're asking for is this. There are millions, millions, and I'm not exaggerating, that's a low number, of taxable value that's going on taxed in our county because of not doing reappraisals and also because of not being able to go in someone's house because they put granite countertops and tile floors and you know built rooms out that were unbuilt before. That 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 according to the law changes what your taxes are without raising your permanent tax rate. It changes the base. So but here's the deal. We went out, we meaning the previous assessor and the staff went out to the three major areas that are going to have the most of that kind of value, Ashland, Jacksonville, East Medford. And they found millions of dollars. I think it was probably $13 million the first year. Maybe it was 23 million. I think it was 13 million in one year in additional value that hadn't been being taxed. But 
that's beneficial to all the taxing districts. In my opinion, it's not beneficial to us when it costs us six hundred thousand dollars to go out and find thirteen million that we only got fifty thousand of. So it is beneficial to the tax industry. It's the reason why I drafted that bill that really gave the county the first increment of funding from those reappraisals to afford the staff that would benefit all the districts. And that bill, I think, actually got reintroduced last, not the special session, but the session before, uh, is because I'm trying to figure out a way. Look, the, the county doesn't, the county as an organization doesn't benefit from this. In fact, it's a, it's a, it creates an operating deficit for us. But hey, taxing districts, you're leaving a lot of money on the table that we could get if you help fund. And so I think I, I said, let us take the first 2% of the total, was it 2% here? Let us take up to the first 2% based on how we certify the tax rolls and how the CAFA grant is certified for each county. That way every county be treated similarly. Let the county take the first 2% until we cover up to the point we cover those costs with the additional staff. And then everything new goes out to all the districts, including us, and everyone benefits. No one loses. Right now, if we do what you're saying we do, which is good for all the districts, we lose because we have to take staff resources and do it that we have to pay for, but the districts don't. That's my lack of comfort with doing what you're saying. And and I don't necessarily think it benefits you as a budget committee member or the county budget. I do think it benefits all the districts. Well, obviously the bill is we can get it passed the way things to do. But we still have kids in school and requiring other services, so you know, there is a responsibility. Yeah, I, I agree. The fairness issue is that uh, people ought to pay, you know, I don't mind paying the tax that everybody else is paying. And it's assessed fairly, and everybody's in the tank for the, their share of it. And Look, I'm going to ask kind of for your confidence for the next year, because we are changing the way we do business up there, and just to address, like, personal property, so the commercial appraisers, when they're going out, they're um, looking at the personal property. The other pieces we're moving forward where larger businesses are going to be able to um, do their returns online. So we're, we're analyzing each one of the programs and making them more effective and making people be able to cross-train in each one of those so that we can easily flow with the deadlines and um, and fund those programs with staffing that we need. So it's getting more effective. It's just it's taking a little bit to put some of it in motion. The other piece is that we'll be having um, our electronic documents all scanned um, by the end of this fiscal is what we want to have done. And that's improving the effectiveness of each program and how we can pull data and look at it. So I'm certainly not being critical of anything. I and I, wasn't I would taking like it the that assessor's way. department to come to us and say, these are the assessment items that are important, that uh, are reasonable, that we can uh, uh, handle. And here's kind of the, our game plan, and here's where we're at on that game plan. And, and whether it's six years, like I said, whether it's six years, eight years, 10 years, I don't care as long as you've got a number and it's reasonable, and everybody says, "Okay." And are you on your, you know, on schedule? And well, and I feel like that's not a okay. fifteen-minute okay. conversation. Hold on, hold on. Joe, just, like excuse me. We're we're gonna yeah. have to end this one, and we're getting into deliberating right now, so I'm yeah. not, I don't want that to happen. So we'll have that discussion when you have your budget hearings. But I need to go to the yeah. next budget review. Yeah. Well, or come and see us. I don't consider yeah. deliberating. Yeah. I'm just wasting the Okay. Well, you were giving some direction, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> no, Which is kind of your style. That's all right. Well, I think what would be helpful here, because we seem to have this discussion every year for the last several years, is to figure out a way to be able to demonstrate progress towards the ultimate goal. And I think that that's what I'm at. goes after what, what Dick is talking about. And that way, there's some simple, easy report that could be put in front of us each year. It's like, oh, look, you made X progress towards this goal. And that might help control this conversation. So. I'll talk to them about the previous uh, request for performance measure, not, or performance measures and outcome measures. Mm -hmm. That was a different assessor though, but I'll yeah, talk right, to them about right, that. Right. And that was what you're talking about would have suited your needs previously if we've if we been able to yeah. cooperation with doing that. And I know that Joe and 
Josh are very capable of putting something together. I have a lot of confidence in that. Yeah. Big for is uh, defining progress. Yeah, progress yeah. might be right. something different that's to right. Josh and it does to you. And they should, it, and they should establish that. So, yeah, and, right. and, and introduce well, that. Okay. That this is <laughs> yes. Craig always says a better idea. That's what I'm trying to get at. This. It's great to have down to 30 people while we're getting the job done. That's what I think. Yes. <laughs> I think they're clearly <laughs> getting in the right direction. I see that like that office there. Right. Over. Over. Good. 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 Right. Good. Good to see you. Good to be here. Much better. All right. Well, you found um, that airplane. Yeah, so we have the uh, airport next. The airport is a non-general fund department. They receive no general fund support. They have a consistent uh, FTE level 40.25, um, managing still some capital projects, carrying a healthy fund balance, able to service all the debt. In fact, this last year we refinanced their debt to save uh, a lot of money. Um, and so they're sitting in a very healthy financial position. Don't have any issues with any of the programs? Um, operate. I mean, it's, you know, I don't have a lot to say about the airport, but I'm going to give Bert a few minutes uh, to go over big capital projects and uh, maybe some small operational things if you want, Bert. Sure, I'll, I'll just give you the highlight. Uh, in the capital side, we do show a lot of money, and I, and I want to say up front that we budget for grants that we hope to get, and sometimes we don't get them, so we have to reconciliate la later, but between grants and things that look like grants, uh, and sometimes we call them grants, but there's a few different titles, we're at about $28 million. In that, a couple of our big things that are coming up right now is, uh, one, the reconstruction of the 20-year big uh, fix for the run money. Uh, and that's going to take a chunk of money. It's also going to be an operational challenge from the standpoint of we're too big to close. And so we will be uh, doing all that construction between 11 o'clock at night and 5 in the morning. And that will still uh, have some flights that will have to adjust around us. But that's big. The other thing, and we're planning this year, or in this budget year, uh, in designing a snow removal equipment building, it's grant funded. Uh, we're actually asking for a little piece from Connect Oregon on it as well. But we wouldn't construct that in, in 14 or 15 and probably I'll do it all in 16. Did I say that right? Actually, no, we wouldn't start in 15. 15. Yeah. Uh, so we wouldn't start construction until next year and into the construction season. Uh, those are the biggies. A lot of smaller things. Uh, our little solar projects are kind of fun. In fact, we're going to celebrate uh, one of those next week. On the operational side, uh, and sometimes I call that real money, and all real, but uh, that's money that we generate to operate the airport. And out of that, uh, we're about uh, $7.7 .7 million. And uh, we strive to spend that very effectively. And when we have an excess there, it goes over into our reserves. And in spite of the fact that the economy isn't quite fully back and we're going to be spending a chunk of money, uh, this budget we anticipate still being able to put $580,000 uh, additional into uh, the reserves. So we feel good about that. Our uh, contingency uh, in this budget, we're proposing about $4.2 million. The reserves are about $4.6 million. In addition to that, we have a few dedicated reserves that we're saving for a specific thing. But, um, it's been kind of an even time for us. If you look at the bar chart that shows in plain and those type of things, uh, it's been flat. But when we compare ourselves around the country with like-sized airports, uh, flat is good right now. But we're ready to start building a deal, and I think, uh, I think that will happen. That's my short version. You want to talk a little bit about just so you know, subsidizing the uh, yeah. residual from the compensatory? Be, be glad to. Uh, we have a formulized uh, way of charging the airlines for the airfield expenses. And the uh, short version is we, we take all of the expenses and we have a formula to divide it fairly amongst the airlines. 
uh, to make ourselves whole. And that's ideal if you can do that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the last few years, that formula put us pretty high to the airlines, and of course we compete with other airports. So we've been taking money that is not airfield money. Uh, we call the airfield money residual, and all of our other monies are compensatory, which means the airlines have no say in how we spend those. We've been taking some of that compensatory money and subsidizing the airfield because we just uh, have to stay in the ballpark on landing fees. And uh, that's worked well for us, and again, we're still able to put some in the reserve. So it hasn't hurt us. In fact, I think it helps us. Um, there are those out there that would sharpshoot us and say, dang, that's what they agreed to, charge it to them. And we could do that, and the uh, first opportunity is some of them could leave our market. So uh, I think we've got the right balance there. So the, the subsidization that you do, is that equally distributed among the airlines, or are you selective in IP? Yeah, it's, it's equal. We just, we keep them on the formula and we put the money in, so they're still paying the yeah, same full rate of share based yeah. on, on actually landing weights. Right. Well, as a frequent flyer, I appreciate the, yeah. <laughs> the flexibility and choice of flights. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and it's helped us a lot over time, and, and being competitive is big to us, uh, and it, it does pay dividends. This summer, and we have seasonal adjustments, but this summer we'll have the best service we've ever had to Los Angeles. Uh, we'll have Alaska who does it daily, but the Legion will be up to four times a week instead of two. Uh, we're having additional service uh, with Alaska Horizon to Portland again this summer, but they try those things, and when they work, you get more of it. So. And we're always looking for additional service. And, and in the line items in there, we budget money because we we meet with airlines, we court airlines, we pitch, we compete, and, and that takes money, but when we get one, it's certainly worth it. Some airlines are formulated in their assessment of whether or not they'll locate somewhere, so people always say, you need to get Southwest here, but it's not happening. Not because we can't do everything we can to court them, but they don't have the population base to serve that they're willing to locate here for. So a lot of the discount airlines won't do that. And Burns should tell everybody about your work because I don't think the budget can Actually, I think you it. should, yeah. Burn Boeing is all more. Well, it's, it's a little, heck of an award. Yeah, you know, Bur 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 Burns won a, won a lot of awards, actually, at least I know for sure since I've been here and probably before that. But uh, in the last six or seven years, it seems like every year Burns winning some kind of award. But this award uh, was essentially what is the equivalent of a lifetime achievement award. Mm -hmm in airport management, and uh, it's not awarded very often. Well, it's awarded often, but not to a lot of people. How many times has it been awarded? 20, what would you uh, say, 23 times or something? It's been awarded less <coughs> times than there's been years of yeah. the organization. Yeah, so it's from the uh, AA, uh, AAA. American Association of Airport Executives. And uh, Byrne was recognized at the chamber for that award, and someone came and uh, presented it to him at the chamber, and it really is a very neat prestigious accomplishment for Byrne. So, and I know that he would now say he wouldn't have achieved it without his staff. So let me tell you that it was also a very uh, accomplished achievement for Byrne's staff as well. And it was so big to me that this is the embarrassing part. But when I read my name, not at the chamber, but where they announced that they would come to the chamber and do it, I was at the lunch with the association. When I heard my name, I almost wet my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to cry. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Bert, next time you tell that story, just say you almost cried. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Girls cry, boys are their issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well deserved. Well, thank you. Yeah. 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 The county was very good to me. The chamber offered a lot of shoes at venue. You know, it was a big award, and that was a great venue. You know, I appreciate the latitude in doing that. All right, thanks to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Almost got you back on schedule. Your CC. Yeah, there really is a difference in what it costs to fly from different places. So yeah. Cheap more. Cheaper to go to Shreveport than to Dallas. I don't want to. Now, why would that be? That makes no sense. I know.
Shreveport. Do we need uh, a right. yeah. yeah. I want to be in Shreveport, but I thought I'd go to Dallas and get it cheaper, right? Okay, yeah. okay. And then okay I'm gonna, I got to get started here so we can get on track, you guys. Sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're with Development Services, and, you know, Development Services has been one of those things that uh, I know the first year I started here, and actually I think Dick was one that did a lot of work on uh, creating the, uh, uh, I mean, it was a community development fee, worked very close with the chamber and got their buy-in and why. The concept was that development services would have been a uh, self-supporting department. Um, the Board of Commissioners does have the authority to make the department self-supporting by fees. They're allowed to charge the full cost out. That's been kind of a political hot potato where over the years they've chosen to subsidize it rather than increase and charge fees. So what I want to point out is in 11-12, we had a budget target where the general fund subsidized the services in the department of 1.12 million. In 12-13, it was 1.26 million. Um, and that was the budget target. Kelly's department did way better than the budget target in each of those years. And in 13-14, which is the current year, the budget target was reduced to 755,000 um, from the from the high of 1.26 million, so a, a pretty significant reduction, of, you know, half half a million dollars. Um, what we did in this budget target is we reduced it again from 755,000 to 517,000. That 517,000 is inclusive of a solid waste transfer that supports code enforcement, which was a decision the board of commissioners made to add two code staff when we had reduced down to one to cover the whole county. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you back that out, you're, you're really talking probably around the $300,000, $250,000 range um, for supporting the services that were in effect at the time the whole conversation about the community development fee happened. So this is moving strongly in the right direction. The reason why we're able to reduce the budget target significantly is because we've had a huge increase in the uh, building side of the department. Um, that's, you know, we've had some pretty big commercial projects come on as well as a lot of residential. Um, we hadn't added any staff. The board did authorize the addition of a half FTE, which was to help cover the front counter um, because we're doing some, also some building uh, software upgrades that the state actually is funding and then we're funding the portion that fits for us for code enforcement. Or did I get that backwards? No, yeah, right. Planning and code enforcement. Planning and code enforcement. For. We're paying for. So um, we needed some help. This budget does increase the FTE even with that reduction in general fund, but Kelly was able to do that without coming in over the budget target that we gave her. Um, in other words, we gave, you know, for all the other general fund departments, we did the 1% increase and then backed out the cost of PERS and those kinds of things. In her case, we didn't just back out the cost, the cost of PERS, we were able to reduce the general fund contribution significantly. Um, so the budget target was 517, 595. She came in at 602,138, but the reason why is because we're going to carry forward 84,543 from this year for that software project that we've already started this year and we need to finish it in next year. So it's already, you know, it, in the modified accrual basis, it's already charged and it will be paid out as it's carried forward as the project's completed. Um, but I didn't want, you know, I wanted to explain that that doesn't count against her meeting the budget target for this year because it's a project we're carrying over next year. Um, so she's done really well with that, but there, like I said, there is an increase uh, in FTE part of which the Board of Commissioners approved in the current year that will carry forward, and then uh, one FT, which is essentially building inspector, if I remember correctly. Construction inspector. Construction inspector. And, uh, okay, okay. Uh, construction inspector and then one half planner one. Frankly, you know, we have performance measures. The public expects that we're out there uh, inspecting as quickly as possible so they can move their projects forward. And we need, we're going to need to continue to add some staff as we're trying to move down that general fund contribution still. But we're going to also need to add some staff so that we can keep a, a, a service level that, you know, that the public can be able to be accommodated for this uptick in construction. We contemplated not adding the staff because 
the construction season usually ends when it starts getting snowy and wintery and more rain around here, but this year it didn't end like that because of the weather being so dry. So it just kept going uh, gangbusters, really. Um, I mean, in the current year, the last time Kelly and I talked, I don't check it now, but we were, I think, 26 percent above our revenue projections for year to date. Um, so even it was, was it, is it still around that, you know, Kelly? It's a little bit less than that. So, you know, it, it's doing well. This is one of those things, honestly, though, it doesn't really matter what we project because we don't have a crystal ball. We, we're, we're doing our best to say, okay, it's picking up. This is kind of what we expect. When it doesn't balance because of those projections we make, the general fund picks up the cost, even though we have a budget target. So we've worked hard to close that gap. And obviously, as I said, from 1.2 million down to a little over 500,000, so $750,000 roughly turnaround. $700,000 turnaround uh, is pretty impressive in that short time. And we have one, about 1 1.5 FT over what the board approved. So, uh, you know, we do have the building planning, which is current planning and comp planning, as well as uh, code enforcement divisions. I didn't miss any divisions today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I'm becoming an expert planner, actually. I know. I, you, it worries me. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, each of those divisions have similar issues that any <coughs> one of our departments that operate on general fund support have, especially when they're fee-based. So when there's an uptick, things get better. When it slows down, they get worse. In, in this case, um, you know, we get a lot of questioning about, well, what about all these fines you charge and all the fees that you charge? I want to tell you very clearly that when you look at the code enforcement budget, about 5% of revenues is what accounts for expenditures in that budget. In other words, 5% of the, 5 of that budget is covered by fines. We don't make money off fines. In fact, really fines cost us money because all the work that goes into preparing for the hearings that are required, doing the field inspections, doing the, you know, trying to get people to come into compliance. And then it's less than 1%, it's 0.8% of the total budget of the department comes from fines. So less than 1% of all revenue that we generate from fines goes to fund the services and development services. I want you all to know that because I know you hear all the time people espousing that we're charging these exorbitant fines so that we can fund the department. It's flatly not true. And the revenues and expenditures represent that in the budget, as well as receipted in our accounting department. Anything you want to add, Kelly? Wow, I was looking at my notes and I think you covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Covered the increase in staff based on um, the increase in workload. And what I guess I would add to that is it's not just an increase from last year or this current fiscal year to what we anticipate for next fiscal year. It's looking at the last three years. Um, and I say this because I, I remember Mr. Rudisile saying, well, is there, a, can you pick up work without having to um, hire? additional people because there's this, you know, there's this margin in there. And I think we've got, we did have that margin and we filled up that margin, if you will, um, over the last three years. Um, and we're at a place now where there's just no, there's no margin anymore. And your elasticity is gone. Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, we hit the break point. Yeah. You know, we've had an 18, over the last three years, 18% increase in plan reviews and a 23% increase in inspections, um, which has necessitated an additional uh, construction inspector. What that will do for us is it will give us a dedicated plans reviewer, which we basically lost when we lost staff. We focused and prioritized inspections so that when, a, when someone got a building permit issued to them, the inspections were, if you called in before 7 a.m. that day, you got a same-day inspection. We were, up, we're doing that about 99% of the time to 100% of the time. But what we had to sacrifice was plans review. So it took a little bit longer to get through plans. And I think this, having this um, position will help us with our plans review to increase that cycle time. And then in planning, customer count, Customers at the counter are up over the last three years, 9% and 22% increase in land use applications over the last three years. 
And so what that does by having a half-time planner one at our counter, it saves the planner twos and planner threes from having to come up and back up basically that one planner one that we have. If someone is waiting more than 20 minutes, we have someone come up, that's a planner two or planner three, and provide service. Well, that takes them away from what their primary job is, which is to pr process land use applications. So by having this half-time planner one at the counter, it saves those planner twos and planner threes for their real function, which is you know to process these land use applications. Um, and uh, better meet our performance measures, which we're doing fabulous on our performance measures right now, I would say. I have to say we're doing pretty well. Do you have some of the numbers? Yeah. Yep. Um, and remember, I'll just, the caveat, and I give this every time we talk about performance measures, we'll never meet them 100% of the time. If we do, we would be providing, in my opinion, poor customer service because there are people, and it's many, who give us an application and then don't have all the information. They ask us, can you can you hold off because I'm really busy this month, I'll get it next month. If we were sticking to these hard, I would say tell them no. If they don't have the information within that performance measure, tell them that we'll either we'll deny the application or they can withdraw and resubmit. I don't think that's a good place for us to be, especially if our customers understand. So for example, for type two applications, these are the easier type two applications. Our performance measure is 50 days. Um, the actual in 2012, 2013, we were at 45 days and we were making that at 85% of the time. Rem remember that the, s the state performance measure, if you will, is 150 days. The law. The law. So we're, per we're performing at about a third of that timeline that we're allotted by the state of Oregon. From when it's deemed complete. So we have a 30-day completeness review, and when it's deemed complete, that clock starts ticking. So and let's back that up. The state gives us 30 days. We have a performance measure of 22 days for completeness review. So we've cut at least a third of the time out of everything that we're required to do, in that case 85% of the time, as compared to what state law provides for a timeline for us to do. And I also want to remind you that I do not believe there's any other county in the state that has set performance measures like that or that processes those applications to that effectiveness across as many measures as we right. measure. Because we not only, I mean, I think there are other counties that measure, but I'm not sure there are very many other counties, if any, through all of, with all these applications that have an expectation of me that set a higher standard than the state law requires right so like I said we'll never be at a hundred percent because we it would because I think that we would be providing poor customer service however you know type 1 applications there is no statutory timeline on the type 1 application so we could presumably take as long as we wanted we could take well, we can take up to 180 days. Um, but we're processing type 1 applications on average 17 within 17 days. And our performance measure is 20. So 17 days, and we're doing that 74% of the time. So I, you know, I think uh, the department is doing very well with these performance measures. Granted, there are applications that um, go to hearing. And remember, if it, our tentative staff decision isn't a final decision, the hearings officer's decision is actually a final decision, and those can go well beyond the performance measure. But they're calculated in the performance measure. So, um, so I think we're doing we're doing very well. Question: If you look at the economic activity we're experiencing in the valley right now, would you would you say this is uh, normal? or still subnormal, or it, I'm trying to get at, could it be better? Or it could be always be better, but I mean, if, if you say this is kind of a... Let's go to 2005. Did you consider 2005 normal for economic activity? What's your standard for normal is the question. Well, I don't know, uh, because you guys have a better feel for it than I do. Uh, well, how about this? I think Danny's right. 2004, 2005, that was our peak. Yeah. 
and it was, in my opinion, um, you know, I think that probably was unsustainable, well, obviously. In 2010, 2011, we hit the floor. If I put in housing starts, uh, we were running as 2 million housing starts or above. I don't think we will see those days for a long, long time. If we're at a million housing starts, that's better than what, at 600. That's double or almost double. My guess and my experience when I look back when I was in that business in the 60s, 70s, a million poor housing starts uh, with a million of them being single family was a normal year. How about this, on one to 10 scale, 10, you know, uh, five being normal, and you know, one being where you're talking on the low end and 10 being on the high end, we're probably about four. We're a little below average still, yeah, but we're picking up. That's what I, I see. If we're at a million, and I say a million four, and looking at that, we're probably 80% of where we're going to be at a, at a normal year. We could even be a three, three, four, some more than that. Yeah. And I would agree with Danny. I mean, I think that we are, I mean, in I think we are at about a three to four. I think what you're going to see in Jackson County is in probably the next 10 years, as you're going to see the cities of Central Point, Medford, um, in the next 10 years you might have Phoenix. Um, you're going to see those cities have um, urban growth boundary expansions and actually annex land for urban development, which takes land out of Jackson County's jurisdiction. Um, but I think where you're going to see the growth is in the, is in cities. Uh, with those expansions. We set out originally to say this is a great community partner. And if you say we're getting more towards normal, uh, that doesn't look like we're going to have a great community partner because if we're looking at $500,000 by 17. I feel sure. like, well, let me answer that a little bit because you know we work on the budget here. We had the discussion about fees last year. Kelly broached the subject about the community development fee because it hasn't. It's been eight eight years since we implemented that. We haven't raised it. We have a lot of fees we haven't done that for. When things start picking up and it requires more costs and more work for us to do, we're going to have to raise the fees. When we raise those fees, especially the community development fee, which overarchs everything, then we're going to close that gap faster. We. Chose, the board of commissioners have chosen not to do that because they didn't want to put, stifle the economy. But when the economy is growing, that's the time we you know, need to do it. And we've waited a long time and not done it. So personally, I believe if we keep the pace we have now within the next couple of years, we're going to close most of that gap. Now we're going to have to add staff too, so that's going to be the balancing act. But um, if we make those adjustments, assuming the economy continues to pick up, then yes, we probably can get pretty close. Well, yeah, with our existing staff over the last five, six years, we've also had costs. Well, actually, what we've done in Kelly's budget, I don't, we don't give you five years. Every year in the last five years, except for this year, we've cut. Yeah, I know, and so we, the individual people that are in the department. Yeah, we, we haven't added costs. We've cut costs by cutting FTE. Yeah, even though those that I mean, their costs of the people that are still in the department have gone up. We have step increases so get those, yeah. those well, things. Those things good. Yeah. yeah. These last two I mean, years, around those. Yeah. You know, well, I, I don't want to say that. But actually, I would say not necessarily because this year we got a four percent reduction in curves. Their cost went down, mm -hmm. and I'd also say that we had two years of no cola increases. Their cost stayed flat. So I, I'm not I'm not wanting to disagree with you, but I'm not saying maybe not exactly because mm -hmm. when purse costs go down, the cost of our employees go down. Yeah, but that's over the last five, six years that they've burned and gone up. Sure. Over oh, talking about five years ago. Yeah. When or eight years ago when we put the great structure in. <laughs> and the staff that still exists, their costs are sure. higher than yeah, they're in eight step years. increases, their costs went up. Which, but, but the other thing that Kelly did was that she replaced higher based on that cost. We could, but we don't choose to yet. No, I okay. get it. I, Okay. Just, All right, you're speaking from one side, I'll speak from the other. I'm just speaking, uh, put a little pressure out there. Yeah, well, 
There's two yet. Must be break time. I, 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 I didn't hear that. <laughs> hey, let's, uh, wow, it's, I think we that's, that's, we're, we're, we're on time, so let's break until 3. Yeah. 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 Hey, Marty, how are you doing? I've got two pieces that finished second in Washington, too, and I watched both shows. So, uh, on Health and Human Services, the way we um, discuss doing this is to kind of have Mark just basically do a quick synopsis. And I want to keep it short, but here's why. Not because I don't want a lot of questions answered, but because this is a moving target, moving rapidly every day. We've been back and forth. See the smile on Harvey's face because <laughs> Harvey's got to do a lot of it back and forth, uh, even up until yesterday. Uh, I talked to you a little bit about the significant increase in FT, which Mark will highlight. Um, and then what I asked him to do was what he normally does is the spreadsheet for you with by program, right? Yeah. Uh, and just I asked him to really just focus on where the general fund's going because all of those other funds are the things that are more moving around than the general fund. Sure. With regard to the general fund, I do want you to know, you know, the major things the general fund funds is gel medical. So even though it's in Mark's budget, it really is a cost of public safety. And gel medical includes juvenile, uh, the talent transition center and the sheriff's department. And it goes to fund the service partner grants and some small little miscellaneous places in, in the budget. My, my point here being that really those, the jail medical and the service partner grants are really not necessarily HHS programs. We just put them there to be administered. So it's really not necessarily money we're spending on HHS. Uh, and I just want to make that clear. The biggest issue for, well, I don't want to say the biggest, one of the bigger issues for the general fund, which in Mark's overall budget doesn't seem significant, but um, is something that certainly becomes quite political very quickly is the animal control budget. It is not supported with dedicated funds. It's a general fund function. It is supported significantly by fees and it's balanced close to the tune of $400,000 with uh, grant funds from the BB um, Trust. And, you know, at that rate, we've only got a couple of years left to be able to balance that budget by that manner. So we are going to need to look at ways to deal with that in terms of the services we deliver to animal control. I'm talking about a dog control, uh, impound, and cats mostly. Um, so I just want to put that on your plate because it'll be something we'll have to have a discussion about. We, Mark and I have discussed it. You know, for this year, we think we're going to proceed and try to close that gap after having evaluated what the um, licensing requirement is at the time of rabies vaccinations, uh, what happens with that, and um, our other normal annual uh, adjustments and fees. And so we'll, we'll try to get it closed, but it'll be something we'll have to pay attention to. And besides that, um, I'm, the sheet you passed out talks to your FTE too, right? It is. Yeah, so go ahead and cover it. <coughs> okay, so it's uh, pretty self-explanatory. The big increase we've had, as Danny suggested, is because of this massive expansion of the mental health benefit and um, we're both a provider of services and a mental health organization so basically we're an insurer of um, those that get the OHP benefit and have mental health issues. So um, as enrollment expands, so too does our per member per month rate of the money that we get to serve those folks. So I showed by example this massive enrollment that has happened in a very short period of time that in, in December, the enrollment of OHP members eligible in Jackson County, who were actually enrolled as 35,000, and then two months it jumped up to 48,000. So the, the increase in terms of the walk-in, we're seeing 20 new people a day that are coming in for services. Uh, it was anticipated that there would be about 15,000 new enrollees starting January 1st through uh, 14 through January 1st of 16 that there'd be 15,100 people eligible, and that 75% of them would enroll in year one. We 
we're not expecting in two months period of time to have 12,000 people enroll. And so we thought we'd have time to assess this and see what the population looked like and be able to add resources based on what the need was and what the money then was coming in, but we've got to add a capacity much quicker than what we were anticipating. So some of the positions that uh, the board, I think, approved, is going to prove um, we need licensed medical providers to determine the medical necessity of Medicaid services, so we're looking at adding some psychiatrists and other positions. So that's really the story of what's going on in our budget. Um, so you see the jump of essentially 50 FTEs, what I spoke to the other day in their budget, which is a lot, and that's what it's attributable to. Can you find trained people that can fill most jobs? We, uh, it's a good question, Dave. Um, we, we enlisted the services of Merritt Hawkins for recruiting psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners. And because we had had an open recruitment for over a year and couldn't find a psychiatrist. We had, through that contract, I think 12 to 15 folks that they put in front of us. We have a psychiatrist coming from Michigan that will start in July 1. We've got a psychiatric nurse practitioner coming from Eugene that will start next Monday. So we're having some success, but we've had to use some creative ways to we go about five of those. Do what? We need five of those. Five more. Of those. Five more. Five more of those. Yeah. But HR has been great in this recruiting firm in terms of looking at new ways of trying to recruit people. And I think too we need to look at trying to grow within our own community. So we've been working with um, you know SOU and other universities to see how we can take their master's trained folks and try to get them into practice and internship programs through our department. But can we find them all at one time? Probably not. It'll be a phase in approach. You work for the community college. Uh, do they have any programs to help you out? A, a little bit, but um, the only program that they really have that's of real value to us is the, is the licensed professional nurse, which if we have a choice between a two-year degree nurse and a four-year BSN, we try to go with the BSN as much as possible. So through the SOU, they have a, a partnership with OHSU to have a nursing program here and I think it's 15 students that come through a rotation with us so they have a three month rotation through us so we try to pick the stars when we when they when we can but the nurses straight out of, out of college oftentimes want to have a little bit more sexy job than what we provide in public health when they go work in the hospital. So it's a challenge. But HR again has been real good at working with us to try to make some adjustments to what our salary and some of the benefits we can offer to them for some of the knowledge. Uh, we also got some new monies from the state for, for some grants that we have. Those will almost entirely be passed through to community partners. Um, just in terms of what's going on in the department, we have almost entirely new senior leadership. We've got a new developmental disabilities manager that we stole from Lane County because they're having very problems, so we're able to get him. And Stacy Brubaker has been here for a um, year and a half now, but she's been the division manager for a little over a year. She came from Utah. And that's one of our recruitment strategies, quite honestly, is that uh, Salt Lake City in Utah, their mental health system has had some um, downsizing, so Stacy has been able to pull some of the folks from Utah as much as possible. So we've actually got two uh, that we've landed from Utah, and we hope to get more. So uh, Danny talked about animal control a little bit, and then also um, in our developmental disabilities program, there's this huge change going out of the state of the expansion of the K plan, which basically they're trying to expand the services for kids who have developed, developmental disabilities, but um, there's no money for the state to pay for this expansion, so we're quite concerned about what that's going to look like. And then we're preparing to move into the new building. So those are the highlights. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So we started charging him um, to all the divisions. At one point, we were having to dedicate, because it was just public health only, but what we did um, with some of the time that he spent in animal control and a DD and a mental health, we made him the health officer for the entire department. So now we charge him back to the departments. Oh, no. And you're just seeing the portion of the yeah. charge that's allocated to the general fund. So now mental health's picking up a big portion of his salary. Also saw down on the bullet board, mental health you know, practitioner one, two, threes, and advertising for jobs. What are those jobs? 
Um, probably a mental specialist. One, yeah. two, and three is what, so, what you probably saw. Are those um, nurses? No. There's two, two distinctions per the state statute. One is called a qualified mental health professional, QMHP. They have to be master's trained uh, clinicians. So those folks are the threes. The twos are what are called QMHAs, qualified mental health assistants. And those folks are case managers and skills trainers that basically are helping these individuals get to you and from the appointments. Psychologist or psychiatrist, a little bit. Yeah. They help facilitate the case plan. Yeah. I have a couple of questions on your spreadsheet. Sure. On your general question. Drug, uh, alcohol and drugs went up quite a bit, you know, percentage wise. 40,000. We pay a share of that. We pay a share of that. We do. we do pay a portion of it. We, we had typically put in about 160000 last year. We contracted that out to the Addiction Recovery Center to actually run the survey that we used to, as you'll recall, three or four years ago. Um, the City of Medford kicks in some, Central Point and Ashland, the Community Justice kicks in a little bit. Uh, the increase is due to a capital expense of having to have some roof work and parking lot and I think part of the sidewalks. I, I do want to just clarify something. Um, and we get into this every year, but, and Mark provides this nice spreadsheet, but we give him a general fund allocation, and he moves it between programs. We didn't increase the general fund, even though he increased the portion that goes to A&D. We didn't give it more to increase that portion, he took it from somewhere else. And we give, give him the latitude to do that because he can, you know, has some requirements at different places and can match grants sometimes. And yeah, I just wanted to make sure of other, other public entities are paying their fair share of it. Docs or wasn't that the part of this, or is that all of it or what? It's sobering. sobering. De detox is actually a little bit more medically advanced. Okay, than sobering. Yeah. It's, it's, it's for the sobering unit, that's their portion. Well, let, let me answer that question more directly then. Other public agencies are not paying their fair share of the cost. The biggest user of the facility is the city of Medford, and they don't pay anywhere near the percentage of use that they have. With that said, we did work out an arrangement, which this is additionally reflected in the sheriff's budget, I didn't mention it the other day, where they're renting, the city of Medford is renting two jail beds. This is in addition to the federal beds. That generated about 70,000 a year in additional general fund to us. That means we didn't have to give 70,000 to the sheriff to support his current operations. And the concept was that that was a way for them to contribute to the needs at sobering but them get a direct benefit out of locking up two people that they wanted locked up. We didn't increase Mark's budget target by that, though. And I are having some discussions about how we might address the issues with sobering. Um, we, you know, we're looking at some rules and regulations around how funds can be used and all that kind of stuff, but we're just getting started on that. If we do, we, we have approached the city of Medford. We approach them every year. The, but, I, but I have to say this, even though they're not paying by percentage of use the their equivalent share. If they, if, you know, if we say, well, fine, we're just going to shut it down and not use it, where those people end up is over at our jail. So we suffer the burden no matter what. And if we can get them to participate at all, it's better than the alternative, which is we just bear the full cost, put someone in jail rather than helping them sober, which is way less expensive. Yeah. I'm Completely sold on the idea of sobering. It's just trying to get people to pay their share of it. Uh, on their public health, what's the hundred thousand dollar carryover? Is it two thousand? No, that's on this sheet. It's the uh, Holbrook Ready. To, oh no, I'm sorry. Wait. So we had we had some grant funds from the state that we didn't expend in one of the years, and we oh. asked the state and they left. It's they not a general fund carryover. It's, those were state funds that we were those allowed to carry over. Yeah, yeah. hundred thousand. Yeah. Well, I've, the reason I said that is because I thought public health was basically the only fund. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Now, to, if you look at the overall budget of public health, it's about six million. So seven hundred and forty-five thousand at the general fund. Yeah. Okay. There are some things in public health that the county is mandated to provide. There are other things that public health does, a lot of, through grants and partnerships. And you know, as Mark said, we pay about one-seventh the budget 
of public health from general fund contribution, I think it's 700,000 roughly. You said it was 6 million. 745. Mm -hmm. Review for me again, what is our obligation to public health as a county? Well, the biggest one is the immunizations, which we also receive grant matches for, and what's Mark, you can make this more detail than I'm going to be ready for. Yeah, so when we, when we accept the intergovernmental agreement through the Delegate Authority for Public Health, we have immunizations, vital records, family planning, communicable disease, maternal child health, uh, and kick in any time. I think, those are, I think those are the key ones. Um, so we have to do the birth and death certificates. Uh, any communicable disease outbreak, whether it be STD or a whooping cough, pertussis type of a situation, we do all the contacts and do all that investigation to try to curtail that disease outbreak. The family planning we have to do as well. Uh, way back when somebody said the level of support we have to supply as a county is a county public health officer. Well, I, I, I don't know if you said that, Dick, and I don't know that, you know, I, mean, I, I don't believe that's true, but I don't know who when you say way back when, what do you mean like way back before? I was we were looking at what is out of flame or times were tough. What is our total obligation to these different areas? So we, 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 we this is this this gets a little bit difficult because you know there's been a lot of changes and I, I don't this is going to get complicated. So this is why I'm telling this. There's been a lot of changes in law about where the money goes. Okay, and then nothing changed about who has the liability. So when you look at coordinated care organizations or public health. The public health official is the county. Dr. Shane's in our county, right? Is that who we go? me. He's our health officer. Mark is the designated public health official, and then Dr. Shane's our health officer. Um, so we don't have to provide the position, we have to provide the authority. So when you say we have to provide a position, I mean, and I don't know what the qualifications are for the person to be a public health authority, or off the public health authority. Um, in Mark's case, he's not a doctor, not yet anyways. And um, so, I don't know that we necessarily, but we have the responsibility, you know, same thing over on the mental health side. I mean, we have that responsibility, but we don't have the money anymore. It, it's out of our hands now. But we have all the liability, but we don't have the money. Now, we get the money from contracting with people who enter into an agreement to do services that we can only do under the authority we have to do it. So. It gets a little complex when you start asking questions about what exactly do we have to deliver. It's more a responsibility than it is necessarily an employee or it may be even necessarily a service. Well, and Mark, you can add to that because you're more familiar with the yes, law. No, what I'm getting at is the public health budget is $6 million, right? And we're $745,000. And over time, this hasn't changed in 10 years, but I mean, over time, how much of this is, quote, backfilling where the state didn't fill the need, or somebody decided, no, no, this is a county function and needs to be filled, as opposed to the state function that didn't get filled and we kind of filled it. And I don't know, today we've got a good answer to that. Well, there's some that's things. kind of the question. There are some things that we have chosen to fill that maybe we don't have to, but we can take what we've chosen to fill and match it and leverage funds and get more service to our community because we took that fifty thousand in general fund to match it to a program to bring in two million bucks or a million bucks. So there are choices that are made about how that money's spent. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily get we we could get down to the detail of where every one of the $746,000 are spent. But what we really try to do is get the greatest amount of service for the least amount of money. Most of what public health does is funded by intergovernmental <coughs> agreements that make us have local control. It gives us the money, but it gives us some latitude to develop a public health plan. It gives us latitude to apply for and be funded for grants that support public health in our community. There are rules we have to follow that come with that money in the IGA that the state gives us. So um, it's he, here's the difference between this and other services. You say if they go away, we're not going to backfill. This is a partnership for us. We are a contributor of funds to it to bring more service to 
people. We want people to be, you know, essentially public health wants people to be immunized. Immunized. I know there are people that don't believe in immunizations, and we know that's their either their religious right or um, the other. <laughs> yeah, I can say that. Um, but you know, so. So I guess it's not as firm. Now I will say this, if we have a specific program that we went out and applied for a grant and we've added a staff because of it and that grant goes away, that staff goes away. We don't, we don't backfill something like that. But we do use our funds to match grants to bring more service. But if it's that specific clear cut, we're applying for this specific grant to this specific thing, we go and hire someone and that grant goes away, that person may go into another program or something, but we don't keep funding that position from the general fund. And Mark, you can add to it if you want. Yeah, essentially we're getting down to those core functions that we and only we can do. We took the school-based health centers two years ago and contracted that out, so the clinic and community health center are running both of those. We're no longer in that business. Um, <coughs> HIV, um, we have to do the testing, but the case management services, we don't have to provide that. So we contracted that out and actually had the state contract directly with the HIV Alliance out of uh, Eugene, who also has a nurse that's in Josephine County who works between our two counties. So. I think we've really tried to get down to the point of what are those essential things that we and only we can do. So that's where we dedicate our kind of resources to some of those things. Over in addiction services, you had two people before, big budget. Is it all <coughs> contracted out? It's almost all contracted out. Okay. Yeah, we've, we, we've chosen as a county for years and years not to be the provider of alcohol and services, but also just to oversee them. So we are the local alcohol drug planning authority. No people. With one person. Hmm. Right. So we're probably there in administration. This third sheet that you've got here. You're looking at dedicated fund yeah. stuff again. Yeah. I'm very this one this right one. here. Yeah. yeah. So I'm very easily able to trace these numbers back to your big spreadsheet. So thank you for that clarity and the way you put that together. So in looking at the 13, 14 column, 14, 15 column, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm, I'm assuming by looking at this that you're redistributing the money a little bit differently than you, I'm not criticizing, I'm just asking. Yeah. Um, so for exa example, Dr. Shames, there is nothing for him in 14, 15 or for his program. There's nothing for disease control and there's nothing for community health hazards and there's nothing for WIC and there's nothing for developmental disabilities. Am I reading this right? That's right. And you're taking, taking those monies and redistributing them to these other That's right. program ones. Okay, just want to make sure I understood what you're doing. Here. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that example, like where developmental disabilities is, where we put some money into it, yeah. to bring additional funds for services. Like I said, we leverage sometimes with that. And the other thing is, um, some of those things went away in the market. I mean, some of the things we, well, we were not doing. Yeah, DD, for instance, went to a different mode of reimbursement, so it's a fee-for-service model. So we don't have the ability to take county funds and match them dollar for dollar, so that, that is no longer a possibility. Dr. Shames, he spent a whole bunch more time in mental health, so we are charging almost entirely to mental health. Yeah. So that's kind of the example of it through each of these. Community health hazards was for uh, rabies and norovirus outbreaks of tracking people's time and so Jackson when he was in environmental health was doing a lot of that but now that he's in public health and a portion covers his time that that service is being covered but it's just being distributed budgetarily when, when you look at the overall each of the programs in Mark's budget and I, I, I caught April kind of doing this a little bit so I want to give everybody a little explanation you'll see changes in FT that are fairly significant but there's been a complete restructure in Mark. Mark talked about a whole new leadership staff, but also how the department structure has changed a lot. A lot of stuff became centralized in admin. So where things might have been charged out to a program, they got brought into admin so that they could serve all the programs instead of each program having their own sure. where they could do that. And so the the net result is a you know a 50 person increase mostly due to mental health. And now today I think we approved. Um, nine positions, seven of which were not mental health. So there's some public health from, or backwards the other way. Um, so there was some for, but they were grant related positions. So when you look at this and you see, you know, some position missing, and Mark was just talking about drug and alcohol with, with April is, you know, we administer that program. We used to sign up to the program and it's an admin. So 
it's just a movement of the FTE yeah. with the reorganization. And Mark has probably not got a most recently updated org chart, but he's got one with his department that shows the, the structure, maybe with not all the new positions yet and the new people. These 50, you know, the ones we approved today, the uh, 14 we approved today, and I don't know if it's more recent than that, but if you, if you kind of want to see how it's structured and where those FTE are by program, He's got a really good uh, spreadsheet or a org chart for that. Well, this is just this format is just so helpful for me to be able to easily see what's going on. And you know, when when we get questions, well, Health and Human Services is, they're eliminating programs, and yeah. it's really yeah, easy really to see. Well, yes, yeah. there have been some that where funding's going away, but it's not going away. It's being reallocated to this program or that program. Or when they talk about 50 FTE being hired, you know, you, we can, well, those are dedicated funds. It's not coming from the general fund. So having this is very helpful for me to get a clear yeah, picture a of, of the very complicated budget. You know, yeah. What's going in that big building? Yes, Where are they? Right, Where are you right. spending all the money? Did uh -huh. you sign up? I mean, yeah. There's a lot of conversation right, right there. Right, I agree. This is just no, no, I agree. I'm not, just, I just want to get some more explanation yeah. for you because you're asking yeah. questions. I wasn't. I didn't mean that. Yeah. Anybody have any last questions for Mark? Could I try it once more? <laughs> sure. I'll take your own detail. Family planning. Forty six. Are you on? Are you on the big one? I'm on the little one. Little one. Yep. Okay. Family planning. Forty six thousand. What? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven years ago, mm -hmm. is now yes. three hundred and five thousand. Yes. That is strictly a county initiative. Is that right? Family planning. Family planning. It's not a state. It's a state requirement that we, as a public health authority, provide family planning services. That's the way that reads. An unfunded demand. Well, this is only the portion that the. So when we receive the state funds in the IGA, there's a level of service that they're paying for, but then that we're obligated to provide services to anybody who can't pay. So, so much of what we bill to the state is paid for, but there are some people who don't have one or four health plan because they, you know, for whatever reason, can't get enrolled, and they come to us, and we have to still offer that service to them. So, and there are many arrangements in that IGA like that. It's not just family planning, it's organizations. It's, so. Okay. That's, I guess, what's troubling me a little bit. I'm not against it, I'm not trying to eliminate it. I'm trying to understand it. And so, if the state's paying the majority of it, but there are people that somehow don't make the state cut, or there's more people than the state can pay for with either way or not there. Why is it the county's responsibility to take care of it? Well, by, by accepting that IGA as the, mental health, as the public health authority and because of our commitment to try to deter unintended pregnancies, that's just historically what we have committed to as, as a community. Um, it gets very complicated, particularly as the CCOs enter into this, because the state funds are matched through a program called CCARE. They are able to take every one state dollar and turn it into 19 federal dollars that they then distribute down through the counties, through the public health authorities. As more people become enrolled in um, OHP, there are going to be fewer of those people that are going to get the reimbursement at CCARE for every family plan visit we get $155. As those folks have moved then on to OHP, the CCOs will only pay $78. That's the DMAP rate. So this, quite honestly, with all this is going on, is our best guess to keep the current capacity that we have intact. And we're going to have to adjust and watch this through the year as the enrollment goes over um, from, D, from Division of Medical Assistance Program through the state that we bill to the CCOs. So we're going to the CCOs to try to get them to fund it, not the $78 level, at the $155 level, what we currently had, because we're trying to make it, get them to make an investment in what we have had a pretty, pretty big burden on. Us. And, and there's really two things here. There's our obligation to family plan, and then the state being willing 
to partner with us to bring more money for us to be able to do it. And I'm going to give you a much simpler example to understand. We're required to have juvenile detention. There is no way that we could afford to run the juvenile department on the general fund. But we're required to have juvenile detention. So what we do is we enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the state for juvenile crime prevention dollars. Now, they give us that money and they say, hey, you can use that money to help run your detention, but while you're running that detention, you have to do all of these things too. Okay, so that's what I mean by a partnership. This is the same thing with family planning. You have so, so many things that you have to do as a county as family planning. And hey, we have the ability to take $1 and turn it into 19. And we're willing to give you that to help you do family planning, but if we're gonna give you that, we want you to do this. It's a trade-off. It's a trade-off in our favor, as you can see. Yeah. Get my mind on Carter. The juvenile detention is stated in state law that we have to furnish that through the county, right? Uh, well, it doesn't state that specifically, but juvenile services are the. There, there is no state law that requires the state to provide any juvenile services. No, no, no. But I mean, it requires the county to have a juvenile. It, look, let me, let me even, re, let me even back off that. We're not required to have a juvenile detention center. You guys could say we're not going to have one. We could rent one bed from Josephine County. We could rent one bed from Clown County. I mean, you could make that choice. But I'm under the assumption that you and our voters pass it, believing that you okay. know. I don't want to get that. Thing. There's nothing in state law that says we have to provide as a county family plan. Yes. yes. That's what I'm telling you. It's the same there thing. There is. There is. It doesn't say that we have to provide all the things that we're providing because of the IGA we have with the state that brings additional funds to bear on what we want to deliver. That's all I want to know is there is something in law that says the county is responsible for family planning. We form a partnership that don't have the state furnish as much money as we can get from the state. Essential. Oh, that's the simple route. version of it, yes. That's your example of the <clears throat> Mark, is it reasonable to assume that when you're putting together a budget like this, that you sit down with your staff and you're assessing these areas, and, the, and that the, the changes that you're putting forward, for example, with family planning, are based, are data-driven decisions based on the best thinking of you and your staff? That's right. So, to, I think that where, where I struggle here is that if we look at the dollars that are allocated from the general fund for 1450 it's not quite $2.5 million, and we go all the way back to 08, 09, and that we're getting $2.3 million, yeah. you know, and those are, you know, in constant dollars, they're not inflated. Um, and I think that I'm getting the impression from my perspective that Mark and his staff are doing the best they can to take dwindling resources and reallocate them where they best see the need for the public to be. Is that a fair match? Okay. The only other thing I want to say is the data that they're basing their decisions on is moving more quickly and changing more quickly than it's ever changed yeah, in this year. Right. Right. If it were a, a normal year, like Mark just said, hey, this is our best guess, but it may come in way. We may, it, it may require more money or it may require less. It's probably yeah. going to require more. Right with the current service level because the reimbursement rate of the CCOs is less than the match that the state brings with our IGA. Now, those are all things that we also, outside of the purview of what you do as a budget committee, are negotiating with the state. We're saying, wait, 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 we're not gonna do this in the IGA anymore. In fact, Mark and I have gone round and round with the state on the IGA requirements, and we said, no, you can't tell us to still do this when you're changing the amount of money and having the same expectation with us. Now sometimes they say, well, if you don't like it, then leave it. And that's where a board of commissioners get to make a decision about the policy implications sure. because of the service level change. But we have done, and Mark, I'm gonna say and Melissa, have done an amazing job watching out for all of that criteria and those IGAs to make sure that if you're not funding us and you're not giving us the authority, then we're not gonna do this. I think this is the new novel. Yeah. Yeah, there was no right. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank
Dick. And I'm off the record right now. Okay. Um, if you want to step out and talk to me, we can do that. <laughs> on the record. Thank well, you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank um, you. Thanks. If we, if the budget committee at some point says, as far as the general fund, we're going to look at all health and human services dollars. We are going to do that, but I'm just trying to understand. Is there anything that says, no, you're required to do this or this? Yeah. You're required to provide general medical care. That's a big portion of what you give them for general fund. You could take it out of their budget, but you got to spend it somewhere. It's constitutional and statutory. You got to, you have to provide the care, both. Um, and besides that, there's all sorts of case law as well. Uh, so so that's, that's probably the major one. There are public health components. Mark covered the six or seven of them that we have some level of obligation for. Right now it's about 700,000 that we're spending. Now I couldn't tell you today whether that obligation could be cut back to 400,000, but there is a requirement for mandates of the county for certain things. It's, uh, among those being immunizations, family planning, those types of things. Um, the, uh, the other part in there that's probably the biggest consumer that is the service partners, and you already know the answer. Yeah, those those we have flexibility, I'm not saying we do it, but I'm just... Uh, well, those we, you can say you're not doing it. I'm yeah, we can just say we're not going to do it, and right. that's the end of it. And there's no legal or constitutional right. requirement that we provide funding to that, the service partners. The veterans and this. But there are both constitutional and statutory requirements for some of public health, and gel medical is both a constitutional and statutory requirement. And it falls under the obligations of the sheriff, you know, that he's required to operate a jail. That these are constitutional versus statutory. Attend upon the court, provide for extradition, provide for death investigation, provide for animal death investigation. So there's there's those part, those parts that are part of the office within the constitution, and then there's statutory requirements that drive the you know requirements for the um, proper care, custody of inmates, so on and so forth. Those even drop down as far as administrative rules. So there's administrative rules. Department of Corrections manage that. They contract with the sheriff for implementing and um, ensuring that they're complied with the sheriff's association, not our local sheriff. So, but I mean, that's a general thing. If you want me to get down to every dollar, it'd take a lot of work, big. No, looking for some guidance here, so. <coughs> we have Expo next. Um, let me grab them before. No, before, the, before they come in, can you just give a quick recap of where we're at right now after that last Okay, so that the commissioners agreed to waive the fund balance that they were carrying of about 330000 The commissioners also agreed to purchase the rights to the cell tower lease that they had. You know, and we computed the value on that. They were going to sell it out for 190000 The future value to be adjusted for the inflationary uh, component was over a million too. And I just thought it was ridiculous that they were going to sell it out for that purchase it because of that. Even the present value was five hundred and some thousand dollars. Um, hundred and ninety thousand. So we put it into our property management department and we'll go to the general, you know, go support property management the general fund. Um, and we'll have lease payments on it. Um, there is a, a opt out clause ten ten year in or five year increments, I'm sorry. The, the, the lease renewal is five year periods and there's an opt out clause where they could lease out but our opt out of the lease. So uh, I'll be I'll be honest with you, the reason why I still recommend it is because even though every budget cycle, the budget committee and board say we're not giving you any more money, in the seven years I've been here every year they've decided to give them more money. And I thought we're gonna right. if they're in trouble, we're probably gonna end up giving them this money anyway, so right. why don't we right. maintain the benefit so, of the future? So the buy out of the lease was in Fusion of capital for them, how much? Yeah, 190,000. So, what happens is they start with a pretty good fund balance, I think, to 200,000. They end with somewhere around 100,000. Are they seriously on track for that, or they piss it all away? Well, uh, I'm going to find out. Not that I I'm going to find out because I, I, <laughs> I do have a couple of tough questions for them in their budget. They put the 100 plus thousand dollars. I mean, honestly, we just gave them 500 grand. I mean, 330 plus 109 getting 520,000 um, dollars, and that with that they're going to end the year with a little more than 100,000 dollars in an unappropriated ending fund balance. Now, this is the question I have for them that will answer the question: 
is I'm not sure that they understand how to put that in an unappropriated ending fund balance that they can't spend it. And so what I'm going to ask them today is, do you know when you put that in an unappropriated ending fund balance you can't spend it? If you're going to need to spend it, you're going to need to put it in contingency so we can pass a board order or reserve so we can do it as a supplemental budget. And then we'll find out how serious they think their budget's going to work. Because if they say we need to put that in contingency just in case, then you probably have your answer. You guys got your work cut out you for do. you. Yes. John, I missed the beginning of that conversation. What lease did they buy out for that? Craig, did that answer all your That cell phone tower. That's what I thought. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. How did you miss it? You were here. Pardon me? How did you miss it? You were here. Did you I, doze off? For a second? No, I was doing okay. something else, and all of a sudden he was on the, the middle of it. <laughs> So they did release a little bit the other day, 5,000 for something. They're going to hold their feet in front of the boat. That's good. Yeah. How are you doing? How are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, good to see you. Hi, how are you? Hello. Hello, hello. Good to see you again. Oh, yes, thank you. So um, just to kind of cover the broad information, their adopted FTE for the fair or exposition park was three for 13, 14. They added 0.65 back to that. During this year, they're requesting 3.02 uh, in this budget uh, for next year. Um, so uh, essentially what they adopted last year, 0.02 more. Um, and then the 0.65 has been uh, temporary. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you raise your hand? Oh, okay. I thought you raised your hand. Sorry. Um, but essentially, where they were at the beginning of where we adopted their budget last year. You all know that ending last fiscal year, they had a negative fund balance of about 330000 uh, The Board of Commissioners agreed to waive that. Not waive it. The Board of Commissioners agreed to pay it from the general fund. Correct that. Uh, and incur the expense of the general fund. In addition to that, during this year, the county agreed to buy out a cell tower lease that brought roughly $190,000 in revenue to the uh, expo fund. You pretty much know about all the things they've done to continue to try to manage the operations to reduce costs and increase revenues. Um, in, um, you know, essentially they start off with a positive fund balance of 138 thousand dollars in the proposed budget they end with uh, 108 is an unappropriated fund balance and the balance is contingency so they they budgeted 30,000 in contingency with this budget and 
and I didn't want to ask you guys on the, uh, and Harvey said that he had this conversation with that just now, so you hopefully have had the conversation, but um, you left $108,628 as ending fund balance, but you balance it as a line item, as an unappropriated ending fund balance, and you realize if you do that, you can't use it. So did you mean to do that? Or did you mean to budget as contingency so that if you need the money, you have access to it? Because an unappropriated ending fund balance, with the exception of an emergency, and an emergency doesn't constitute you don't have enough money to pay your bills. It constitutes there's an earthquake or fire or something like that. Um, so that was one of the questions I had. Harvey said that I guess he asked that about. So do you mean to not have access to that? Because it will be locked up. You won't have access to it. Do you not need it, I guess is what I'm asking, based on the budget you submitted? Correct. We, we don't need it, but we're also banking on something new by the process. You can't yeah. access it. Okay. If you want to access it through a supplemental budget process, we can put it in reserves as that might happen. You put it in unappropriated in fund balance. That means no appropriation authority in. So we can do it as I guess the question is how certain are you that your budget's going to work, that you don't need to access that money, or do you need to access it because you're not certain that what you've submitted is? Confidence level is the highest and most conservative that we've been in our opinion, so. I mean, if it's easy, you can do it. Yeah, I, I didn't really consider it, but two, those two options, so if it's easy, you can, you can put it in the You can do that. But the intent was to go to what you can help. Well, we can make it so you can't need the money, is what I'm getting at. <laughs> because the budget committee decides that. So it's a question for you that you need to decide, not if it's easy or not easy. If you don't want to have access to it, then leaving it in an unappropriated ending fund balance is a good thing to do. We certainly do have access to it. You need access yes. to it. Okay. Guaranteed money to come forward and that's the balance that's the next That's what we need to You know, if you didn't want access to it, that'd really be showing off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to show off. <laughs> so, uh, my understanding also is that um, they will have some direct payments, possibly have some direct payments for certain services that support the Fair and Expo that won't come through their budget, they'll be uh, paid directly for by the uh, Fair Foundation once they have an agreement about how some funds they have made available will be spent, is that, that correct? That is so when you're looking at these numbers, you know, I think when the Board of Commissioners was asked if they would waive the fund balance, they were told that we're able to get a $300,000 donation, but we can't do it because we have this fund balance. They're not gonna receive that donation as part of their budget, apparently. Apparently the Fair Foundation's holding that and they're gonna agree to spend it how they want with the Fair, rather than give it to the Fair and let them spend it how they, the Fair directly wants it. Is that correct representation of that? Or? I don't know the, the, the certain amount of money that they have. I'm not privy to that. Um, I do know that we are not gonna get a gift of $300,000 from the Fair Foundation. However, we are going to get some help recently and entertainment. Um, but not through your budget, they're paying us separate. That's what I'm trying to make sure. That is correct. Promote. Yes. Or we're going to promote it, they're going to pay for it. Okay. So they're not telling you what they're going to pay for it? No. We have, we have not come to an agreement yet. We have come to an agreement, but it's coming through. Okay. We're trying to figure out artists and all that. Yeah. All right. I just got my foot in my mouth. So the donor is has some strings on it. What it sounds like. Yeah. Chris, you know, let's assume that the foundation <coughs> gave $100,000 to bring in entertainment, and then uh, say that entertainment brought in 150. Does the fair get the 150, or do they just get the negotiation? I see. Okay. That's a negotiation. But we do have a, a, a tentative agreement um, that that we will get our entertainment buyer to look at who's available when we're doing that as we speak present those options to them, which they will choose whom they want 
and then we will go ahead and produce the that entertainment out there. But they'll pay the bill. But they will pay and the they'll bill. pay it out of it will have not it won't come through the county at all. So it's not represented. <coughs> but they um let's say one more thing. Yeah. Um, the thing that they've that they quantified it with is they want the grass to be free. And go to the grass at a concert, you'll have to have a paid admission to the fair. So that's how they are generating revenue for us. That's the way they see it. And those revenue generations are projected in your in your yes. revenue, so that wouldn't create additional revenue in no. what you budgeted. Is the Fair Foundation separate? <coughs> yes. Yeah. Totally mutual exclusive of us. Okay. So although, wow. although one member of the Friends of the Fair Foundation is a member of the Fair Foundation. The, the reason why I'm bringing this up is we would have expected to see a revenue of $300,000 from their budget based on the justification the board was provided for why they were raising the phone numbers. So that didn't happen. It's going to happen another way. And Chris says that he's not sure about the amount. That's the amount that was represented at that time. So I don't know what the amount is. But because it's happening another way, it's not going to be in our budget. I'm sure we'll be able to find out once they do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. uh, and I, I never represented that amount because I'm not on the principal fair foundation. I think that was uh, uh, another member of the not no longer on the third board. Well, I'm not. I, I wasn't pointing the finger at No, no, no. I just like <laughs> for everybody's knowledge. <laughs> well, we'll let you believe that was. That's my We're not going to get three hundred thousand as long as the county didn't write off the and that's negative where I, balance. That, that's what I understood too, Mr. Sergeant. Yeah. So the, the budget's balanced. It ends with a positive fund balance, uh, assuming that we don't move this into reserves and they don't spend it. But if the budget works out the way they're proposing, they're working on shoestring FTE. I mean, I don't think that there's an ability to cut back anymore that way. Uh, and um, in terms of what they've submitted, assuming the assumptions they've made, which are their assumptions are correct, and I don't have a problem with the budget. I did want you to know those circumstances because there are things that you have been interested in and asked questions about um, even prior to this review. So, um, if there's anything you guys want to add, I mean, it's it really is a small budget. Um, it's a small number of FTE. Uh, it's um, gone through a lot this last year, and I will say that it was nice. In fact, I think I might have given it. To maybe just Chris or maybe Dave too, to run a monthly uh, report on their fund balance and see a positive uh, balance in there. Was a, you know, it's the first time I've seen it since I've been here. <laughs> so it was a good thing. Well, part of the reason is that uh, the 190,000 we paid for the communications tower. The reason we're starting out. Well, I, yeah, I think it has to do with the board agreeing to. Pay the negative fund balance, and then the hundred and ninety thousand dollars brought them revenue. They're obviously going to spend a small portion of that because they're only going to carry over what they were proposing carrying over is an appropriated one hundred and eight thousand. So they would have spent eighty three thousand of that. And I don't know. For, well, thirty thousand is in contingency. And you, you do know for contingency, you can spend that with the board. It doesn't require a supplemental budget. So I consider that spent rather than. Reserves which require you to go through a supplemental budget process and not appropriate, which you cannot spend at all. But we'll move it into reserves, um, but that will require a supplemental budget. And then also, if you collect more revenue from whatever you end up working out with, I guess the Friends of the Fair or whoever else, you only still have authority for what your budget's approved. So you'll have to do a supplemental budget if you want to spend that as well. But you just said, and I think it was good for everybody here. Very conservative, you know, in at least in terms of everything they could predict. So um, it seems to be to be less unstable than it's been in the past. It seems more stable, and that's what I'm hearing from you, correct? Uh, and the assumptions and the work they've done to be able to estimate their costs have gotten a lot better, um, and they're much more familiar with what their costs are, and much more. Um, in line with projecting the revenues. So I don't have a problem with it. And I, you know, honestly wish them luck, especially if they can end the year with a positive fund balance. Um, 
108 would be good. 250 would be great. Do okay, you, yeah. you have one more thing to say? I do not. You <laughs> kind of like you do. Nope. Dave? Yeah, our goal would be to increase the fund balance from now on. Right. Oh. Mutual goals. Yeah. <laughs> right. Let me, let me ask some questions that are less positive. Uh, how much, kind of a series of questions on a year from now and when you end up your next budget year, your fare is right at the first month of the new year. How much cash do you really need to make the fare work? In other words, you get right up to the fare and you got to start the year. So you're ending fund balance at the end of this budget year. What's the minimum you got to have in there to kind of get through and put the fare on and get through? Do you have a number in mind? The expenditures under the fair care budget. Fair budget is separate, so we be able to work. Huh? The, we budget the fair separate from all the other interim events, so it'd be that. Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking cash. you got to have some kind of cash to pay bills and stuff to the fair. He, he, I think he's getting out. Are you going to need short term cash loans to carry you until you realize the revenues from the fair like you needed in the past? That was supposed to not need to happen again, but because you have a fund balance of 100, and, you're only going to have a, a contingency of 30. That fund balance you weren't going to be able to spend, and you can't technically you can spend it as long as you don't overexpend your total appropriation authority and you end the fund balance with that amount mm -hmm. of the reserves. Is 100 that, that essentially leaves you 130 thousand dollars for cash for paying for whatever you're going to pay for before the revenues start coming. And I think what he's trying to get at is that enough. Are you, is the county going to be loaning, loaning you money? Is that what you're getting at, Dick? That's what it's yeah, saying. That's what I'm getting yeah, at. Yeah. I'm not too sure you shouldn't leave it restricted so you can't spend it. If you get to the end of the year, do you need $100,000 to pay bills before you get revenue out of the fair, as Danny points out? What do you need on July, fir or July 1st in cash in the bank mm -hmm. to make it through the next that's month right. before you get revenue? Right. Do you remember that number that's about it? Pretty fair question. And that's where I think you got to start. Yeah. Is what's the minimum cash we you can live with? And I would restrict it, and that'll force you backwards. If you run out of cash, then you'll do something. Because the only shot you got to save the fare is hope like hell that fare comes off good. And if you had uh, run into about this time of the year out of cash because things didn't work out right, and you got to shut some stuff down and you got to do some desperate things for two or three months. At least you got some money there you can put the fare on with and get through that and give yourself another shot. So, so the Dick's point, point which that. I think is a good point, is the, the comment was made, well, we're going to be building the fund balance, which I think is a great goal to have. But it's the question is, how big does the fund balance have to be to get to a place where you say, okay, now I have enough fund balance, i.e. cash in the bank, and the rest that I earn above that, I can start reinvesting in mm -hmm. programming or infrastructure or that kind of stuff. But I think there needs to be, a, a, on your part, a good understanding of just how big does that fund balance need to be to be considered financially sound. So they're saying set aside the money you're going to need July 1st every yeah, year. So right. there, regardless of how bad of a year you have mm -hmm. or how good of a year you have. But right. I'm mostly concerned with having a bad year because that's where we say you can't put on a fair. Because the agreement we have, if you the worst the worst case happens and you run out of money, let's say in February, my understanding is you're not coming to the county for a loan. That's what I'm saying to you. And the county commissioners have all assured us that they're not going to give you one. Now they may change their mind. I can't dictate their policy. But as a budget committee, this is our understanding. You guys are on the last time around. And the only shot you're going to have is have enough money in the bank to put fair on it and maybe pull yourself out of it. But, uh, you know. Do you guys, you know, we have some time, okay? We have until we bring the budget to them. Do you guys, do you want to have a discussion with your fair board 
and find out if you want to leave that amount unappropriate or not. It, l listen, let's say you went broke, and Dick gave you the example in February. Okay, you had no money in the bank, you had to shut everything down. If you had that hundred and whatever sitting on an appropriate form house, you would have a budget then July 1st of that amount of money that could produce or help produce a fare. What, what amount of money is it that produces the fare? So that you're not borrowing money from the county, but you can still survive. And you probably, before you say, you know, move that money into reserves or keep it on an appropriate fund balance, you probably need to have that conversation with the fair. My personal opinion, and don't take this wrong, but every year it's under delivered. I think you're going to need that money to get through this year. You may. I think we're hopeful that you have a good fare, make a lot of money, and, and the other things happen. But my, my opinion is if you lock that money up, you're probably going to be closing down the fair earlier than you thought you were. If things, if the course of history repeats itself. Now, I know you've done a lot of things to change that course of history, so I'm not demeaning that, but um, their, their comments to you, I think, are caution about you know investing in your future by locking money away today. Yeah, because you've used half of that $190,000 fiscal year, which doesn't make my heart warm. I, if you could have put the fare on and ended up with $190,000 at the end of the year, uh, I'd feel a little better about it. But you already used half of that. Uh, what we budgeted to use? Sale of the uh, cell tower. And 30000 of that is in, the, is in the count. And the other was, like we, like we told you, yeah. um, to purchase infrastructure. But, uh, so. Anyway, that's. You guys want some time to talk with. I just wanted you to ask. I'm okay if you want to give us an answer later because this is not a difficult change for us to make, but it needs to be appropriately represented because when they do drop the hammer on the budget, if it's un in unappropriate, in front, that's where it's standing. You can't use it. So maybe you want that, is what they're saying. And their caution is a good caution because maybe you can't do that yet, is what you guys need to figure out. Trying to help out all our little work. We appreciate it. Any other questions? Well, before you leave, I want to say, you know, I've sure heard some good things recently. Well, you've seen the figures on some of these events, like the monster truck, you know. Is there any plan to 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 reassess how you're renting the facility for those? Because it seems like you've had a couple of real real home runs recently, but you haven't got much in return for it because you're just renting the facility. Now, maybe you made it up in, uh, in uh, the beer sales and things like that, but boy, I've heard some real success stories out there recently. <clears throat> yes. Uh, we had our opportunities some years back to put a lot of those on the percentage, and they opted to do the easy route, which is just be a renter. So now we have a successful land. It makes the negotiation tougher. But the reality is they're all up for grabs and then we have had some successes. We made triple the money on food and beverage in the year on land the last time. Okay, that's real good. And that's, and that's good. We had the we had a percentage cut on food and beverage. We, we can go into negotiations with three or four of them so they've done pretty well as of late. And we think that there's so many. But the ones that have a ticketed product, the Sportsman Show, the Monster Truck, Circus, those are all upside opportunities. Yeah. Sportsman Show is the other one. It was really well attended. Yeah, I mean, really? Yeah. When yeah. we are looking at doing um, wintertime concerts in the Compton. That's right. Because I think that's an opportunity we have that no one else has mm -hmm. in the wintertime. So we're not against Brit. We don't you know, have discretionary summertime spending. We don't have an issue with that. But those wintertime shows do really well because of the competition around here. And the summertime is, in, is immense for the discretionary spend, spending for families. So, we're going to look at that. You got Lithia out there this weekend, haven't you? Correct. Do you supply the food and the drink? And is that what, what goes on? Just the They're thing? selling cars. Yeah. And the food and drink is very, very good. Okay. Uh, however, this, the, the notion of Lithia on the on, positive on was long-term contracts with them, be it on naming rights or even uh, rentals for car sales, those end in 2015. So, 
so we have that opportunity. And that's been, we've been hung with uh, those contracts since we got them. Those and that was all money up front. Those were negotiated by the okay. previous okay. board that right. we're having to deal with. Inclusive of the use of the car on the space, car rentals. So we end up, those are negative cash situations. Right? And 2015, that's up for grabs. So on the whole many light side of things, all that sort of stuff is, is, a, is a two and one four. Have you guys, I didn't notice a change, but have you guys actually been able to raise more sponsorships and those donations that are directly reflect, reflecting your budget since the board did waive the negative fund balance? Because that was a big barrier for you guys. Mm -hmm. but we're, we're doing very well with sponsorship recruitment. I'm on a, no. 30, 40 hours a week uh, with our personnel changes and step back in and the materials that we're providing are pretty optimistic. It's not terrible. So what kind of dollars are we talking about? We have covered a million. We have a million. 20, 25,000? Uh, this was more. And, and what is it? What was it? A point of discussion with them that hey, we're not going to have to pay back the county with this money and all that kind of stuff. Not this one at noon today, but the one I had uh, yesterday. So, so that, it was at least helpful to you. That's what yeah, I'm trying to do. Yes, oh yeah. absolutely. It's to be able to say. I mean, this is the first time we've been. I've been here 40 months, and it's been a red ink. So I'm going, hey, look, this is where we're at. This is the plan. It is going to work pretty well. And we were concerned because we lost a staff member, and that staff member was an integral part of the sponsorship program for every event that we produced out there. And there were there were whispers in the community about how many of our sponsorship folks would block. Uh, I never believed that, but we never know. And we're finding that we are getting probably more sponsors coming to us because of the change that they give us. Yeah. So that's a positive thing. Okay. 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 Good. Yes. You let it, let me know, Harvey. Got it. All righty. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good to see you all. <coughs>